Welcome to the study of God's Word recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. All right. Well, I want to welcome again those listening on Grace FM as well as those watching online. Uh, My name is Pastor Micah Claycamp. You guys might recognize my dad. He normally is up here a lot. Bob Claycamp. Some of you guys might not know that we're related, but I'm just letting you guys know that. Um, If you guys would tonight, turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 5. All right, so Psalm chapter 5, you know, it was one of those things as I was uh, preparing and thinking and, you know, just praying and asking the Lord what to, to speak on, Lord really directed me to this in one of the devotions that I did. You know, so Psalm chapter 5 is a prayer of David when he's exposed to danger by evils, evil people in his life, evil enemies, And so often when we face difficulties in our lives, when those enemies come upon us, this we see in this psalm, this psalm is basically a a prayer. And so what I find really neat about this is Psalm chapter four, the ending of Psalm chapter four says, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, keep me safe. So Psalm chapter four is a psalm of the evening and Psalm chapter five is a psalm of the morning. And so as we jump in to this, we'll see. Um, if you guys are taking notes, the outline that I'm going to give you is uh, the first, first verses, chapter, uh, chapter five, verses one through three, is David's prayer to the Lord. Verses four through seven is David's confidence in the Lord. And then verses eight through 12 David's guidance by the Lord. So with that, let's open up with a word of prayer. So Lord, we just, uh, we thank you, God, as we get an opportunity to get into your word. We know, God, that you so often, Lord, are just ready to, to open up our hearts to receive the things you say, God. And so Lord, as we come expectant, as we come with our hearts open, Lord, we ask God that you would do what only you can do, that you would touch the deep areas in our lives, God, that you would enlighten our hearts to see and understand the things of the Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would not only cause us to know things, but to grow in the things that you've spoken to us, Lord. So we lift this night up to you. We ask God a blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. So jumping into uh, verses one through three, David's prayer to the Lord. Now, this is going to be a famous psalm, one that you guys, we've also sung the song, uh, Give Ear to My Words, O Lord. It's a psalm that was a song that was written in the 70s, um, but it's a song that you've probably heard. We'll probably sing that at the end of service as well. But jumping into the, what scripture says in verse one, it says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray, and my voice you shall hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. You know, as I see three things that stand out, three ways that prayer is described in the first couple of verses, we see words, we see meditation, and we see crying. Words, things that come from my mouth. We see meditation, things that come from my heart, and a crying, things that come from my life. Now, as we're looking at David's life, and as David starts out this thing, really, that's kind of what prayer is about. Prayer really comes from those kind of workings in our lives, the things that God is doing behind the scenes. And so often, I think it's interesting as we were looking at the, at the prayer points, that when David was experiencing um, difficulty in his enemy, from, from his enemies, it was in those times that that God used to to bring this prayer about. And how often in our lives does God use difficulty or hardship or maybe uh, times of, of, of it being very uncomfortable where he brings us to a place where we find ourselves praying more? I know that's been true in my life and I'm sure it's been true in yours. But the cool thing is God is always working behind the scenes as in our lives, bringing us to places of deeper fellowship and intimacy with him. 
So as we begin to look at this, we see the words, the meditation, and the crying found in verse 1 and 2. Now in verse 3, David says, My voice you shall hear in the morning. Now this is where I get the, the message title here, Feet on the Floor, Eyes on the Lord. And uh, it looks like the thing's got changed a little bit, but that's what it's supposed to be in the background. Feet on the Floor, Eyes on the Lord. It looks like the, it got expanded a little bit farther. But the idea behind that was, was a phrase that God had given me a while back. And in, my own, and in my own life, when I'm laying in bed, when the alarm goes off, you know, we've, we start our day. But the key thing in that is, Lord, I want to have my feet on the floor, but I want to have my eyes on the Lord. Because so often what we face in life, especially in the morning, is your ears and your eyes are the most open. They're, they're, your, your mind is ready to be filled. But who or what gets your attention in the morning? And this is the challenge for all of us. Because we got that little phone that sits over to the side of our bed that it's just so natural for us to reach over and grab and flip open Facebook or check the news or jump on whatever it might be. And we'll find ourselves, if we're not careful, that we just, we lose that time with the Lord because all of a sudden our day gets busy and then we think, oh man, I got to rush off to work or, or, or maybe we're in a routine in our lives where our routine isn't established with thinking, wow, meeting with the Lord in the morning. David said here, I love this. He says, in the morning, I will direct it to you and I will look up. Prayer needs to be directed and prayer needs to be expected. As we think about the times of the Lord that that God gets our attention in the morning, God wants that time with us. He doesn't want us to get so busy and caught up in, in our schedule that we forget that what if the Lord has a divine appointment for you today and he just wants you prepared for what God has for you. And sometimes it's in the morning that God might get our attention to bring us to a place of deeper intimacy with him. You know, I I find that as I think about this, in the morning, David says, I will direct it to you. I want you to think about this. David is making that statement of faith. Lord, I know that the morning for all of us, some people are morning people, some people aren't. And again, besides that, I look at the Psalm and I see what David said. In the morning, he says, I will direct it to you. It's almost like he's making this decision in his heart. Lord, I don't care what's going on. When I get up, I'm going to make a decision to look to you. And not only that, it says, I will look up. You know, too often in times, we can easily look, as Pastor Ed had said, going through the study of of Exodus, what did Moses do? Moses looked to the right and he looked to the left, but he didn't look up. And when we're dealing with decisions in our lives, when we're facing things in our lives, when we're just dealing with life, so often those distractions would just want us to be able to look to the right or to the left, and they would cause us to make a quick decision or to do something rationally, and yet, or maybe irrationally, we just, we got to do something. And so we find ourselves just caught up in the moment. But I like this, how David just says, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to look up and I'm going to direct my attention towards you because Lord, you deserve my praise. You deserve the depths of who I am. And so before anything else gets gets crazy in my life, before my feet hit the floor, I want my eyes to be on the Lord and what God has in store for me. So number one, David's prayer in the Lord. Now we see verses four through seven, David's confidence in the Lord. It says, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. It says, you hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. And in fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. You know, how often as we quiet our hearts before the Lord, as we think about meeting with the Lord in the morning, as we, as we set our hearts to meet with God and to come into the presence of the Lord, we are often brought face to face with the reality of his awesomeness and his holiness. But as we're brought into this place of prayer, into the presence of the Lord, we're also, we also have to deal with the reality of our sinfulness because it's like we're walking into the light of his presence. And when we walk into the light of his presence, things get exposed. 
And yet the amazing thing is that you can take that one of two ways. We can run in shame or we can say, God, I, I look at my life and what you've done in me, and now I can walk in boldness. And the reason why, let me explain this to you. In Isaiah chapter six, it says, it was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting in a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And they were calling out to each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Now it's weird. You spend time in the presence of the Lord, it's going to change you. Okay, in Isaiah's case, and his, and his vision that, that, that he was in, it changed him. It brought him to the place of just in, in awe. And so it's amazing that it goes on and it says, their voices shook the temple to its foundation. The entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over and I am doomed for I am a sinful man and I have filthy lips and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a, with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs and he touched my lips with it. And he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Isaiah was impacted by the awesomeness of God's presence, but also the reality of his, of his sinfulness. That happens to us as well. And what are we to do? Well, we can do nothing, but we have to come face to face with the reality that Jesus has done everything. Hebrews chapter four, verses four through 16 tells us this. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Two things that stand out here in this. We are to hold fast. We're to hold fast to what? Hold fast to our confession. Hold fast to your belief. When you come into the presence of, of God, you're number one, you're holding fast to what you believe. Number two, you're, you're to come boldly. The apostle or the writer to the Hebrews tells us this, that we're to come boldly into God's presence. We're to come boldly into that place, that throne of grace, because we're going to find mercy there and we're going to find grace to help us in time of need. But so often we don't feel like coming into the presence of, of God because we see our sinfulness. When we come into the presence of God, things are exposed in our lives, but God says that's exactly when the time you need to come because that's your time of need. And for some of us, we get to this place where we got to just say, you know what? I can't trust my feelings. I can't trust how I'm feeling right now. I got to trust through faith to hold to my confession that my life has been forgiven, my sin has been forgiven, and my Father says, come. Come into the throne of grace that you may experience help in time of need. That's a step of faith. But so often the Lord causes us to take steps of faith in our lives because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. For anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Could it be that God wants to reward you, but he's calling you to take steps of faith towards him? These are challenging things, but we have to understand as God begins to speak to our hearts on things, he's not just saying, I'm giving you information. That's a, that's a great idea. He's saying, no, I'm giving you information because it's, it's transformating or it's, it will transform your life if you put it into practice. So we hold fast and we come boldly into the presence of the Lord. David says in verse seven, he says, but as for me, Again, David, David calling this out on himself. This is what I'm going to do, Lord. As for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. And in fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. 
Now, I underline this passage in my Bible, the multitude of your mercy, because I think about this. When we deserve punishment, he doesn't punish us. In fact, he blesses us instead. Mercy is the withholding of a great or just condemnation that is due. I like to think of multitudes of mercies like spiritual M&Ms, you know? So I got myself a bag of M&Ms and I brought them up here. When you, when you open up a bag of M&Ms and you drop them down, you just get a multitude of goodness. Like if I was to pour those things out, they just, they would overflow in my hand and they would fall on the ground. And that's kind of how God's mercy is. It's a multitude. And here I got the, I got the family size. And so I'm even thinking about this. Maybe in your family, you need to pour out the multitude of God's mercies upon your family. You need to share how God has been merciful in your family, what God has done, what type of things the Lord has come through that has just shown his faithfulness. I like these corny illustrations because these help me remember as I'm sitting in the checkout line as I look over, oh, M&M's. Oh yeah, multitudes of mercies. Oh yeah, God's been good. And so those little corny things are help, help me so often in just my, my Christian walk because they just remind me of who God is. And we just need those little nuggets of information sometimes in our lives that just pull us out of our day, that cause us to, to something snaps and it brings us back to that place of remembering who we are in God's sight how God loves us, what God has done in us and through us and his purpose for our lives. The Bible says in Psalm 103, one through four, it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Again, we're talking about the mercies of God who forgives your iniquities who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. We need to begin to highlight these things in our Bibles. We need to begin to write these things in our houses, put reminders on our fridge of the multitude of God's mercies in our lives. Because when we forget what God has done for us, we get caught up in our own lives. And when we get caught up in our own lives, we get our eyes off the Lord. And when we get our eyes off the Lord, we get ourselves into trouble. And so just, in a, just, just kind of a reminder in that. It goes on and it says, I think about this, because of his love for us, God wants us to be with him. And his mercy is required for that to take place. There is an inseparable connection between God's love and God's mercy. Jesus laid down his life and became the sacrificial lamb so that God's mercy could be extended to us. Instead of punishing us for our sin, God allowed his son to take the condemnation in our place. That is the ultimate act of God's mercy. Ephesians tells us, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So good, so good. So how did David have so much confidence in the Lord? It's because he spent time with the Lord. And so jumping into the third point, David, David's guidance by the Lord. This is verse eight through 12. It says, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God, and let them fall by their own counsels. But let all who rejoice in you put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them and let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous and with favor you will surround him as with a shield. So coming back to verse eight, it says, lead me, O Lord, David says, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. David also wrote Psalm 23. 
Psalm 23 is that psalm of Jesus being the good shepherd. Psalm 23, David understood what being a shepherd was all about, but because before he was king, he was a shepherd. He understood what it was like to walk with sheep, to lead sheep, to guide sheep. He understood how sheep functioned. He understood their needs. And as he pens that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I just find it so amazing how it parallels our own Christian lives. As we ask Jesus to be our good shepherd, as Jesus begins to work into our lives, as he says, hey, come follow me because my sheep hear my voice. And David, as he begins to going through this, as we're, as we're going to read, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or basically I have all that I need. New Living Translation says, it says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sometimes the Lord needs to get our attention and just causes us to stop. We can be so easily running around after so many other things and the Lord just says, I need you to just rest. I know what's best for you. I want to lead your life. I want to guide your life. But let me tell you right now, you just need to stop. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It says he leads me beside the still waters. This is an amazing thing. When the Lord is your shepherd, he knows what you need. But not only does he know what you need, he will lead you to those places in life that are going to bring fulfillment and satisfaction. When Jesus is not your shepherd, when you're a rogue sheep, you do what you want. You run and do the things you want, but you suffer the consequences. And the amazing thing that we find in this world is God gives people freedom to do what they want. He is always calling and reaching out towards people that they would understand who God is and how much he loves them. But he also gives freedom to people to make choices. And how I find it so often that people in their freedom, when they choose to push God away and do what they want, they suffer the consequences for their bad decisions, but it always comes back to them blaming God. They blame God for the freedom that God gave them, and yet because of the consequences they suffered. It doesn't make any sense, but that's typically what happens. But the Lord also is a God who is ready to meet that person in a place of repentance, because the Lord will always point them back to his son and what Jesus has done for them. And the Lord will always bring that person back to the place of saying, I want you to come close in fellowship with me. And this is really what Psalm 23 is all about. It says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now that's a hard verse sometimes to contemplate and to ponder. And maybe today you are in the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe your life just stinks. Maybe you're in a place you don't want to be. But if we're looking at the context of Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death is where the sheep is at in that moment. How did that sheep get to that place? He was led there. He wasn't disobedient. He didn't bail on the Lord. He was led there. But understand what it says as it continues on. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the, sh- of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And this becomes the beautiful picture in our Christian life that when whatever we face in our lives, the circumstances, whether they be good or whether they be the valley of the shadow of death, My life is not to focus on the circumstance, but it's to focus on the shepherd. Because it's in focusing on the shepherd that I have peace. It's in focusing on the shepherd that I can get through it. I will fear no evil for you are with me. So often our lives are so encumbered by fear or can be just racked with fear when we just take our eyes off the shepherd and we put our eyes on circumstances. 
Now, we're not denying that circumstances aren't difficult. We're not denying that circumstances aren't hard and that they exist. But so often, they take the wrong place in the believer's life. They grab the attention that the Savior is due. Does that make sense? And so we, we have to understand that the Lord is with us in the midst of our difficulty. It says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And verse 5 tells us this. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I love this picture. We have a book down in the bookstore that Leo Giglio wrote. For those of you guys who, who haven't read it, you got to get it and you got to read it because it's a picture of this. There are enemies that surround us all over. We have enemies in our lives. We have people seeking our destruction. We deal with difficulties in our lives. But according to this passage in verse 5, you prepare a table. It's almost like God just says, hey, you know, come and eat. I'm setting up a table here. I know there's a bunch of stuff going on around you but I want you to take your eyes off what's going on around you and I want you to focus on me. And when Jesus sits down and prepares that table, it's all about intimacy. It's all about personal relationship. It's like, let's have a conversation. Let's talk. But yeah, Lord, what about all this other stuff? He doesn't bring that stuff up. He doesn't, he doesn't say that it doesn't exist, but he says that's not important. And maybe in your life, that's become too important. Those things that are around you and the Lord is calling you back into an intimacy and fellowship at the table with him. Maybe he just wants to speak to you in the midst of what you're going through because he has words for you. We, we, sometimes we don't understand until we just allow the Lord to do what he wants to do in our lives. Everyone's story is different. But Jesus still has the same purpose for everyone, and that's fellowship and intimacy, and he wants to be close with you. Verse 8 of chapter 5 and of Psalm 5 says, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies, and make your way straight before my face. See, because God is righteous, and the enemies that surrounded David in his life were wicked, David's desire was to follow the path of right conduct with the Lord. His desire was to please the Lord. So many Psalms that David wrote. David wrote 73 of the 150 Psalms. And so often in those Psalms, what I love about David is I love his, how he's just so raw. And he's just so real with the Lord. And he's just so honest. And when you're facing difficulty in your life, sometimes you just need to be that with the Lord. Real, open, and honest. He already knows it. And yet, just be real, open, and honest with him. That's what David was. And yet, he's saying, God, I want my way to be straight before your face. I want to choose to walk in the way that's pleasing towards you because there, there are enemies around that aren't doing that. They're doing quite the opposite. David said in Psalm 19, 105, it says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word. God, I choose to follow your word. I choose to walk in the direction of your light. I choose to be in your light, not in darkness. And oh, how good it is to walk in the light of the Lord. Oh, how good it is. Verses 9 through 10 is a description and a destiny of the wicked described. And David's like, I don't want to walk in that way, but he's going to describe it for us anyway. He says in verse 9, it says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouths. Basically, these enemies, they can't be trusted. Their inward part is destruction. The heart of these enemies, their plans, they're going to fail. Their, their throat is an open grave or an open tomb. The words that enemies would have, those that are hostile towards the things of God, they're going to lead to death. They flatter with their tongue. They're just involved to butter you up. And, the Lord, and it says, pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. 
David felt the sting and pain of these enemies in his life. We see many times in David's life talking throughout the Psalms or in stories in Samuel about those people that were in David's life who had stabbed him in the back, family members who had gone astray, all these difficulties and hardships and people that once followed the Lord running from him. David's enemies, it kind of reminds me of our enemy, the enemy of our soul. Satan, John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, You are of your father, the devil, and the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. In John 10.10, it says, The thief does not come except to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. Satan has a price. There's a price on our head. There's a target on our back. But the enemy in our lives doesn't want us to succeed. He wants us to fail. He wants to kill, to steal, and to destroy, and he will use the things of this world to do that. He will use the temptations of this world to do that. He will use the lurings of this world to do that. And yet God would say, child, just keep your eyes on me. Keep your heart on me. Remember that fellowship that we're having at this table in the midst of all the craziness that's going around? Don't take your eyes off me. Listen let me speak into your life. Let me, let me be your good shepherd. Let me lead you where truly you desire to be. David goes on in verse 11 and 12. He begins to de- describe the description and the destiny of the righteous. But let all who rejoice, who put their trust in you, Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. And let those who love your name be joyful in you. You know, the righteous, the righteous aren't made righteous by their words. Their righteousness is by those who trust in the Lord and who love his name. Their righteousness is evident in their words And they rejoice and they shout for joy, for they are joyful in the Lord. This so reminds me of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that we are called to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, to lean not on our own understandings, in all of our ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct our paths. As believers, that verse is not not optional. It's It's mandatory. If you meet a believer who doesn't trust in the Lord, it doesn't make any sense. Now, you may have bouts of of doubt in your life. That's understandable. But the reason why a believer is called to trust the Lord, because that's expected. Somebody who doesn't trust the Lord could be very well somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Now, those are harsh words. Pastor Chuck even said that. I I caught that the other day, and I was like, wow. I said, why is that? Because God is faithful. And if if we are always called to trust in a God who is faithful because he's credible. And so when he looks at our lives and we go through something in life that we don't understand, he still tells us to trust him because we're called to look on God's faithfulness. He's always faithful. He, we're called in our own lives to look back at the faithfulness of God in our lives. Scripture is littered with God's faithfulness of him being a trustworthy God. So if the excuse in a person's life is, well, I just can't trust God, I really question that. Because the Lord has brought us to this place as believers where we should be able to trust God 
And it's in trusting God that our faith is secure. And it's in trusting God that our foundation is laid. And it's in trusting God that we will spend eternity with now. And that is what God wants us to hold on to because he is faithful. Absolutely. And this is so cool. You think about this. God has called us in this race, this race of faith. That as we run in this race of faith, we are to lay aside the weights and the sins that so easily entangle us, as Hebrews says, and we are to run with endurance the race that is set before us. God gives us freedom in what to wear in that race, but not everything that we put on is really going to help us in that race. And you may be the person that fights God on that. Well, God, I just want to do what I want to do. Okay, fine. Wear your mountain boots in your race and let me know how mile two goes. You know, it's just sometimes we're like that with the Lord. Like you're being real and honest with them, but you're really just being defiant with them. You're not willing to let go of those things in your life that the Lord is putting a finger on because you just like them. But just because you like them doesn't mean that the Lord likes them. It really is a personal decision in your lives. You have to think about the direction that the Lord is taking you. We so are often caught up in the moments of life and we forget about our destination. Colossians chapter three, the apostle Paul tells us to set our minds on the things above, not on the things on earth. He tells us that we're to be looking towards those things because where we set our eyes is the direction that we're gonna be moving in. You know, this life is here and it's going to be gone. And we're running our race for the things of the Lord. And Jesus is the author. He's the start and he's the finisher of your faith. And that's the thing that we look forward to, that no matter where you're at in this life, man, the Lord is not done with you. God is still in control. He still wants to use your life if you've been saved five minutes or 50 years. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is ready to use your life right now because it's not about you, it's about him. And it's about him working through your life. To the person that says, oh, thank God, thank God for my salvation, I'll see you in heaven. Some people live their life that way. They think God saved them and is just ready to put them on a shelf and he's ready to see them someday in eternity. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. (laughs) <laughs> because that's not God's heart. It doesn't matter five minutes or 50 years. God wants to work in your life because he is a God who works in people's lives. He saved you for a purpose. He saved you for a reason. He saved you for his glory to be shown in and through your life. Well, gee, God, I don't know very much. That's okay. God knows everything. All he wants to do is fill you to spill you. Okay? He wants to pour into your life so that what comes out of your life isn't more of you, but it's more of him. He wants people to see his filling in your life so that they see the reality of not you, but him. This is the amazing thing of the, like, of the God that we serve. Why would he choose to do that in, in, in me? Why would he choose to do that in you? Because that is, that is what brings him glory. That is what a changed life looks like. And so I just want to encourage you guys, as we've gone through Psalm chapter 5, entering into now, verse 12, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you surround them with a shield. The greatest blessing in your life is to have the favor of God. (laughs) How do you get the favor of God? You receive the forgiveness of God. You receive the promises of God that, that if we, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you don't know the Lord here tonight, Tonight would be a great opportunity for you to do so, to come into the family of God, to understand what forgiveness is all about, to understand who this good shepherd is 
that so often desires to lead your life, to so often desires to show you what true life is all about. Psalm chapter five, we see David's prayer to the Lord. We see David's confidence in the Lord and we see David's, David's guidance by the Lord hey. because of his relationship with the Lord. So if there's anybody here today that would like to give their life to the Lord that God's been stirring on your heart, now would be the time. If that's you, just raise your hand. You've got pastors here that would come alongside you. But again, God is always working. He's working behind the scenes. He's doing things in our lives that we don't always understand. That preparation of the Lord in our lives to bring us to a place of understanding, man, God, something in my life has to change. And it's not about me changing it. Something greater than me has to do that. God's speaking to you, your heart in that. He's just letting you know that only God is able to do that. He's able to fill the depth or the darkness or the hole in your heart that you've so often tried to fill in your own life with other things. And God is bringing you to that place of realizing that that can only be filled with him. Oh, he loves you so much. He'll give you freedom. He'll let you do what you want, but he doesn't want you running laps in life. He doesn't want you running laps and always coming back to that same place because every time you come back to that same place, you're a little more broken. You're a little more bruised. You're a little more in pain. And God understands that because he took your pain upon himself on the cross. He died on the cross for your sin that you might understand what real freedom is. Jesus did the great switcheroo. He took your sin for his righteousness. And he says, you may understand that if you just accept it. And we can only accept the things of the Lord as we reach out for them. If you had your car keys and you handed it to somebody and said, hey, here, here's, here's my car. Or they could say, okay, yeah, I understand. You know, I'm looking at your keys. They only become yours when you reach out and take them. And that's exactly what Jesus asked us to do. For those of us who don't know what a relationship with God is, it's simply that. You're just reaching out and you're taking the forgiveness of the Lord. God will always bring you to a place in your life of desperation first. He will bring you to a place of desperation where you will see your sinfulness. You'll see who you are in light of being in the presence of the Lord. But yet God says, okay, I still accept you because I want to clothe you with my righteousness. I want you to understand that what I have for you is what you can't give for yourself. I want to give you a future and a hope. I want to secure your destiny. I want to give you all the things in your life that you are trying to find, but you will never find outside of me. God loves us so much. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Just thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the way that you pour out yourself upon us, God. Lord, you wish that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Lord, work in the lives and the hearts, deep down in the areas in our lives that we realize something's got to change, Lord, but we haven't taken that step of faith. Holy Spirit, continue to do that work in those people's lives, whether they hear me on the radio, whether, whether God, they're just contemplating the things later on, God, the, the thing is, Lord, you desire to see lives changed because you're a God who changes lives. Lord, you love us where we are, but you won't keep us where we are because God, you desire to do something great in our lives. So Lord God, take those people who think that, Lord, they're, they're too far gone. Take those people who think, Lord, that God's not interested in me. Lord, do a work even this year, Lord, in their lives, bringing them to that place of seeing, God, how great you are. And we thank you, Lord, for the reminder that David gave us in this prayer of just, Lord, in the morning, God, feet on the floor, eyes on the Lord. That's how I want to start my day. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.